Clean Hands Save Lives. Written by Thierry Couset. Narrated by Jeff Burt. Forward. When the implications of the work of the 19th century pioneers in hospital infections, such as Semmelweis, Nightingale, and Lister, were fully understood, they were seen as a revolution in healthcare safety practices. It would be inconceivable to those pioneers that patients in the 21st century would still be dying from infections related to their care. Indeed, they would be truly shocked to learn that the underlying problem of cleanliness continues to be the source of infections in modern hospitals. Yet, around the world, people die or become ill in hospitals every day because they are exposed to bacteria carried on the hands of those who are caring for them. Clean Care is Safer Care was the very first global patient safety challenge started by the World Health Organization as part of its inaugural program of patient safety initiated in response to the World Health Assembly Resolution 55.18 in 2002. A key element of the global challenge was the commitment to improve hand hygiene. Clean hands became the challenge's most visible goal, and this approach resonated with patients and families, clinicians and managers, health ministers and journalists. Experts and scientists worldwide came together to produce a comprehensive set of evidence-based hand hygiene guidelines, and the challenge was embraced throughout the WHO's regions with great enthusiasm and commitment. There was innovation, too. The introduction of alcohol-based hand rubs was shown to be more effective than soap and water. More importantly, its use overcame the lack of easy access to a sink, or in hospitals in poorer countries, to any water supply at all. Successful global programs require great leadership. This book is about restoring the value and virtues of cleanliness firmly established by Florence Nightingale all those years ago. It is about showing how a world committed to health care can embrace a positive change. It is about how lives can be saved. Most of all, it is about how a great leader can inspire, galvanize action, transform existing practices, and sustain the benefit of changes. This book is the story of how one leader, Didier Pite, successfully realized his dream of saving lives through clean hands worldwide with the support of the WHO. It is about how he brought his skill, his experience, his academic rigor, and his generosity honed and developed in the hospitals of Geneva, Switzerland, to serve patients and families around the world. Few are aware of his contribution or even know his name, but many owe their health and their lives to him. The World Health Organization is fortunate that Didier Pite said yes when the call went out for his help. We are grateful for his exemplary leadership and for the bonds that he has helped us to forge with health systems and academic institutions around the world to make care safer. Much can be learned from the story told so well and so inspirationally in this book. It deserves a wide readership. Dr. Margaret Chan, Director General, World Health Organization, and Sir Liam Donaldson, Patient Safety Envoy, World Health Organization. Prologue, Section 1. In mid-March 2012, I received an unexpected phone call from Geneva. I just met the most extraordinary doctor, my friend Genevieve cries. She is speaking loudly, brimming with enthusiasm, emotion choking her usually hoarse voice. He's incredible. You must write about his life. The Queen of England dubbed him commander of the British Empire, but nobody knows him, not even here in Switzerland. He's on the list of Nobel Peace Prize candidates a professor of medicine who saves millions of lives every year. A month later, I find myself seated opposite Didier Pite, an athletic 50-year-old with a passing resemblance to Indiana Jones. His amber eyes still dappled with sunlight as he has just come back from Afghanistan, where he spent 10 days visiting the country's hospitals as a delegate from the World Health Organization. Although Didier is supposed to be explaining his work to me, in his head he's still in the stark light of Central Asia. In a voice that is sometimes serious, sometimes filled with laughter, he tells me about his journey. Didier is wearing jeans, hiking boots, and a backpack, with a large wheeled suitcase trailing along behind him. He is walking through a narrow concrete maze beside his friend, Professor Kurt Wilhelm Stahl, a retired doctor and biochemist who devotes his efforts to treating leishmaniasis, a common skin disease in Afghanistan. The sun is approaching its zenith. In the stifling heat, 
Didier and Kurt Wilhelm leave Gate 1 of the NATO military base at Mazar-e-Sharif, not far from the border with Uzbekistan. Two gray walls over four meters tall and topped with barbed wire hem them in. Above their heads floats a hot air balloon loaded with radar equipment. Planes and helicopters crisscross the sliver of invisible sky. In some areas, wire fencing used in place of the concrete walls allows them a glimpse of Gate 2 three kilometers away. Their backpacks and the suitcase start to weigh upon them, as do the gazes of soldiers stationed in the watchtowers. However, complaining is out of the question. Afghanistan has been at war for more than 30 years. Didier thinks of his children, his family. Once again, he has abandoned them, using up vacation time to travel around the world doing volunteer work. So, you won't be spending Easter with us, his wife Severina said, reproachfully before he left. Didier replied that the Afghans needed his help. His repeated absences may have cost him his first marriage, but he feels no guilt. The previous evening, when the airbus used by the German Luftwaffe to transport NATO troops made a stopover for the night at the Termez military base in Uzbekistan, Didier found himself face to face with a WHO poster, a sort of comic strip page in black and white, drawn in a clean line style. The illustration was of two hands clasped together, fingers interlaced. NATO's graphic designers had replaced the official logo with their own as if to say they'd adopted the message, Save Lives, Clean Your Hands. Little by little, all over the world, the idea is sinking in. Didier had already scientifically demonstrated this almost age-old truth. Now he needs to explain, train, and convince people of it. Every day, at least a half a million patients are infected in hospitals. While 20 to 50,000 people die as a result of failing to follow an ostensibly simple practice. It's a silent pandemic, sums up Didier. With a gesture as simple as cleansing one's hands, it is possible to at least have these numbers, reducing mortality in developing regions by 50 or even 75 percent. Afghanistan is the 130th country to join the World Health Organization's hand hygiene initiative. Didier and Kurt Wilhelm approach Gate 2, defended by Macedonian and Croatian soldiers, in battle fatigues. They make Didier enter one stall and Kurt Wilhelm another. They search the two doctors. The backpacks are emptied and then the suitcase, which is stuffed full of posters, brochures and, most preciously, small bottles of alcohol-based hand rub, the miracle gel developed by Didier's team at Hopito Universitaire de Geneva the teaching hospitals of the University of Geneva. It is a product we all discovered back in 2009 during the H1N1 flu epidemic. It is now sold everywhere, having found its place in handbags, kitchens, schools, bathrooms, and globetrotters backpacks. A few drops, 20 seconds of hand rubbing, and goodbye to viruses and bacteria. It's quicker and more effective than soap. 30 minutes later, Didier and Kurt Wilhelm find themselves back in the overheated concrete maze headed for Gate 3 under Afghan control. Are they going to search us again, asked Didier. Don't you worry about that, Kurt Wilhelm reassures him. The alcohol won't be a problem. If our Afghan friends are there, everything will be fine. Didier doesn't want to think about other possible outcomes. Instead, he reflects back on his morning. Having just disembarked from the troop transport with his eardrums still ringing, he was invited to visit the military base's hospital, an installation equipped with the most modern technology. Didier spoke with administrators, nurses, and doctors. He questioned patients. He looked at the radiography of a case of hepatic echinococcosis. He was asked for advice. He promised to give a talk before his departure. Didier likes hospitals. When he was younger and took on individual cases, he loved the actual human contact with patients. Like a sculptor working with clay, he literally took them into his hands. Through his fingers, he felt their life. Now he experiences the same emotion with respect to hospitals. Didier has visited so many establishments, studied so many health systems that he has ended up acquiring a sixth sense. Hospitals have become his new patients. But between him and the Mazari Sharif Hospital, there now stand two Afghans in black turbans with bushy beards, crooked teeth, and assault rifles in their hands. These local soldiers remain steadfast in front of their sentry boxes. It is the last checkpoint. Beyond them, stretching all the way to the limits of the base, is a packed line of trucks, pickups, and a vast assortment of other vehicles. 
imperturbable beneath the sun in the desert dust. Kurt Wilhelm presents the mission order. Other Afghan soldiers come forth. By reflex, Didier shows them his Swiss passport with the white cross on a red background, the symbol of the red cross reversed, held out like a talisman. Look, Faridula and Ibrahim are here, Kurt Wilhelm says happily as a pickup advances to take charge of them. Prologue, Section 2 Didier is talkative. He abbreviates his technical explanations with words like thing, stuff, doodad, etc. He praises Kurt Wilhelm's enthusiasm fulsomely. Fantastic, marvelous, extraordinary, brilliant. It is obvious that the man likes people. Didier extols the courage of Faridula, the dermatologist, and Ibrahim, the young surgeon who, under the pretext of being an apprentice, does not even receive a salary. I think of Steve Jobs, whose biography I just finished reading. I am facing someone who is every bit as exceptional. Didier Pité is not only a top-notch scientist and a doctor of world renown, but also a gifted communicator, Genevieve told me. When they make a movie in Switzerland, they put 100% of the budget into production and 0% into promotion. And as a result, no one sees the film. But Didier has understood that proving the technical effectiveness of hand hygiene is not enough to make it a universal, enduring habit. The idea has to be promoted, giving everyone the opportunity to adopt it as their own. Didier seems to me to be a visionary, yet politically astute, pragmatic, yet perfectionist, intransigent, yet charismatic, creative, yet directive. A cocktail of character traits which at first sight seem contradictory, but when assembled together, engender outstanding human beings. This can no doubt be exhausting for the person's entourage. Like Steve Jobs, Didier suffers from orthorexia, an obsession with eating correctly, and also living correctly, waking up correctly, thinking correctly. He's very ortho-something or other. But the similarities with the founder of Apple end there. When, along with his team at HUG, Didier developed his alcohol-based hand rub and the associated protocol for its use. He could have registered a patent, created a thriving company, and become a businessman worth millions. Instead, he decided to share his discovery and offer it to the whole of humanity. He showed us the direction the economy could take in the 21st century, an economy based on sharing rather than capitalization, an economy of peace rather than one of predation. Steve Jobs was said to project a reality distortion field. He would bewitch his audiences. Didier has a rather similar power. In less than four years, he was able to persuade more than 15,000 hospitals to adopt his hand hygiene program. For my part, I allow myself to be charmed, touched, and moved by him. In my mind's eye, I join him in the disorderly warren of the Mazar-e-Sharif Hospital, the only hospital in the northern region of Afghanistan, with all of 400 beds for 8 million inhabitants. Along with Kurt Wilhelm, Didier observes the dermatological consultations in the Leishmaniasis Center. While subcutaneous injections are being administered, he helps a mother hold her six-year-old daughter with an infected thigh. The girl screams and cries. Then it's the turn of another, even younger little girl with a lesion on her cheek. If she does not receive treatment as soon as possible, she'll be disfigured for life. Next is a teenaged boy, followed by a woman whose nose is being eaten away by the disease. Between attending to each patient, nurses rub their hands with the alcohol-based gel brought from Europe. Didier advises them and shows them the correct protocols, which are all the more vital as the hospital is cruelly lacking in supplies. There are few gloves, and needles must be reused. The service only possesses one sterilizer, a model that has been prohibited for use in Western hospitals for 30 years now. Further on, Didier discovers the obstetrics and gynecology clinic with its molding walls and damp, poorly aired and overcrowded rooms. Two to three women share a bed. Some of them are there to give birth while others are waiting for an operation. Didier notices a few WHO posters about hand hygiene. It is a good thing. The more dilapidated the institution, the more disinfection becomes a critical issue. The patient's survival depends upon it. Hundreds of children overwhelm the pediatrics service. 
The neonatal service does not have any respirators. If a newborn child has to be intubated, the infant is doomed. There are 11 incubators, a quarter of them out of order for 16 newborns. The math is sadly easy to perform. There are sometimes three infants per incubator. There is only one sink, not easily accessible, and in any case, there is no water. In these conditions, hand hygiene is impracticable. Bottles of alcohol-based gel would mitigate the problem, but there isn't enough of the product. The single nurse on duty, an American, speaks of countless fevers and infections. Each week, she witnesses tens of deaths. In another overheated ward, 18 children are being treated with their mothers next to them, often deeply religious Muslim women wearing blue burqas. The chief resident asks for advice from Didier, who examines x-ray results, in particular those of Siamese twins joined at their legs, who will probably never be separated. He examines some children and the other mothers ask him to continue. Didier assures him that they are already in good hands, that they should trust their local doctor. A woman in a burqa implores him to look at the child feeding at her breast. She approaches Didier and suddenly breaks taboo. In her eagerness to persuade him, she lifts her veil, a gesture that could lead to her death by stoning as a punishment. Didier hurriedly examines the child, and then all the others, and each time he rubs his hands with a few drops of the alcohol-based gel. Didier leaves the pediatrics service, visits others, and the hospital itself becomes his privileged patient. There is no question of letting it down. In order to treat the ill, one needs first of all to treat the institution responsible for their care, overriding corruption and special interests. So Didier meets with the various academic, governmental, and religious authorities involved. In this respect, at least, he is lucky. Hand hygiene is simple. Everyone understands about hands. We all learned from our mothers to wash up before eating. We're not inventing new scanners. And since I have nothing to sell, there's no money to give or take. I'm simply there to help. So people listen to me. I explain how to produce alcohol locally, how to make the gel on a shoestring budget from sugarcane and paraffin, for example. As Didier tells me about his journey, I realize the scope of his work. I have only one desire, to ask him to tell me his entire life story. I want to know by what miracle he found himself at the convergence of human nature and science, how he came to understand that a gesture as simple as cleansing one's hands, repeated tirelessly, could save tens of thousands of lives each day. I want to find out what obstacles he's had to overcome, what pitfalls he has avoided, what preconceptions he has had to fight. I sense in him the stubbornness of the mountain climber, an extreme perseverance, a greatness of soul, and a boundless generosity. I imagine that his initiative in its very simplicity has raised the hackles of the technocrats, the big pharmaceutical groups, and the international medical community. I realize above all that the hardest task still remains, making hand hygiene an everyday habit for each of us, and thereby saving an even greater number of lives. I need to learn more, to learn from one man's experience something that might be useful to us all. Chapter 1. When Hospitals Kill On the 16th of April in 2013, the Canadian folk singer Rita McNeil died at the age of 68 following post-surgical complications. The same day, a rumor began to spread on the internet and in the traditional media blaming the tragedy on a nosocomial infection or, in other words, a disease contracted in a hospital. The bugs patients catch while in care sicken 250,000 patients annually, wrote reporter Andre Picard in The Globe and Mail and kill between 8,000 and 12,000 Canadians. They are one of the leading causes of death in this country. They kill twice as many people as breast cancer. So why do we tolerate this? In the debate following the death of Rita McNeil, Robert Patterson declared on his blog, hospitals have become the most dangerous place you can be in today. He cited statistics from the California Department of Public Health revealing that one in 20 hospital patients get infections. In California, roughly 200,000 people get hospital infections annually, and 12,000 of them die. That makes such infections one of the state's leading causes of death, ahead of automobile accidents. 
Throughout the United States, nosocomial infections kill 200,000 persons every year, the equivalent of a 747 airliner crashing every day, or a person dying every three minutes. One might even agree with the French philosopher Michel Foucault that the hospital environment itself creates disease by means of the enclosed, pestilential domain that it constitutes. A few hours after the announcement of Rita McNeil's death, a press release denied that any nosocomial infection was a factor in her death. McNeil was already seriously ill upon arrival at the hospital's emergency room, and human error was ruled out as a contributing cause of death. But diagnoses are rarely as clear-cut and convenient as officials suggest. I was returning to Paris on my motorcycle when I was struck head-on by a suitcase that had broken loose from a car, recalled actor and songwriter Guillaume Depardieu in his autobiography, Tout Donné. Half of my leg was torn off, my shoulder was screwed up, and my arm was broken. On a freezing Saturday evening in 1995, Depardieu was admitted to the Raymond Poincaré Hospital in the Parisian suburb of Garches. Depardieu is a big fellow with a sad smile who would spend the next year of his life in the hospital undergoing dozens of operations. The medical staff at the hospital recommended reconstruction surgery for his right knee. At the time, said Depardieu, I was feeling good. I could walk. So I had mixed feelings about undergoing the procedure. It's weird because I hesitated and I should have listened to my gut feeling. The initial operation went well, but the knee construction failed. Guillaume agreed to another procedure, replacing his damaged leg with a prosthesis in April 1996. Obviously, when they put in a prosthesis, they have to take things out, he explained. That involves operations they refer to as minor, which aren't as complicated as surgical reconstruction, but do require opening up the body and entail a risk of infection. And that's where, in my opinion, my troubles started. After multiple surgeries, Guillaume Depardieu contracted two types of golden staph. The bacteria were eating away at him from the inside. It felt like a carpenter was filing down his bones. A few years after the accident, the pain became so severe, Guillaume decided to have his leg amputated, even though he knew he would run the risk of the staphylococcus spreading to his brain, as in the case of French billionaire Jean-Luc Lagardière, who died a week after a hip operation. Guillaume Depardieu survived. During his subsequent physical therapy, he was shocked to find himself meeting hundreds of other victims of nosocomial infections. In fact, I discovered something much more serious than cinema. Since I'm always in need of battles, this became my new battle, the most important one in terms of its urgency. Because there was a gulf, not even a gulf, but more of a whole parallel world between what people knew about what was going on and what I was seeing and rubbing shoulders with. He created the Guillaume Depardieu Foundation to collect testimony from the 770,000 French people who fall victim each year to nosocomial infections, of which 40,000 prove fatal. Within a year, everybody started to be afraid of hospitals and began to take a closer look. The figures are frightening, said Depardieu. In a tragic twist of fate, in October 2008, Guillaume contracted pneumonia, along with a new infection by a methicillin-resistant golden staph. He died three days later. A Chinese proverb says, When you're ill, a good meal is worth more than a stay in a hospital. The blogger Robert Patterson goes even further. The first step would surely be to avoid surgery. Much of surgery today is not vital. But what if you have bad knees? I was on my way to join this group myself. But since I lost 35 pounds, my knees are, of course, much better. His reasoning is irrefutable. Medical intervention is never as plain and simple as doctors like to suggest. They're eager to perform a triple heart and lungs transplant, forgetting a little too quickly that a few days later, the patient could be dying from a common infection caused by a poorly sterilized instrument, remarks Didier Petit's wife, Severina, a former communications officer for the hospital at the University of Geneva, and therefore familiar with the behavior of the medical profession. Didier adds, in Switzerland, it's estimated that 70,000 people are affected each year by a nosocomial disease, with 2,000 patients dying as a result. Contrary to what one might imagine, these infections are not limited to exposure in hospitals. 
They can also be caught at the doctor's office or in an examination room. Studies show that intensive care units present the greatest risk of infection. It is not so much the sector where one is treated that is responsible, but rather the condition of the patient. The weaker a person's natural defenses and the more invasive the treatment provided, the greater the risk of developing a urinary tract infection, pneumonia, or post-surgical complications. According to Pite, 50% of flu cases observed in hospitals are nosocomial. This is because patients infect one another, because healthcare professionals are not systematically vaccinated, and because visitors bring viruses into hospitals. Dozens of elderly patients succumb to nosocomial flu. One day, a young man confided to Didier, Grandpa had to die of something sooner or later. But for Didier, death always comes too soon, especially when it could be avoided by just a few simple gestures. That man's grandfather could still be alive, said Didier, with the quiet emotion of a doctor who will never become resigned to the death of a patient. In the WHO's Burden of Diseases report on the primary causes of mortality, nosocomial infections do not appear due to the lack of reliable global statistics. Statistics are complicated, explains Didier. If a patient with prostate cancer has a heart attack and dies, what is the cause of death? When a leukemia patient dies of a nosocomial infection, the cause of death is registered as leukemia. Of course, leukemia made the patient vulnerable, but saying that it is the sole cause is inaccurate. According to our estimates, nosocomial infections kill more than tuberculosis, malaria, and AIDS combined in any given year. In the West, these numbers represent 69 deaths per 100,000 inhabitants, a morbidity rate higher than lung cancer, making nosocomial infections the second most prevalent cause of death tied with strokes. Chapter 1, Section 2 Guillaume Depardieu paid with his life because of a medical fact doctors have long been aware of, starting with Francis Valfogel head of internal medicine in the bacteriology laboratory at HUG. This Geneva University professor has spent his entire career fighting infections. Vod Fogel's American peers have respectfully named the Swiss infection specialist Mr. Staff in reference to his fundamental research on staphylococci. The HUG researcher derives a great deal of pride from this moniker and it gives him an unshakable confidence that comes across in his authoritative manner. In October 1983, Wolfogel welcomed a young Didier Pite, who had just acquired his medical degree, into his service. He beheld a 26-year-old doctor with tousled brown hair and a piercing gaze. Didier first came to Wolfogel's attention three years earlier, during a medical emergency in which they were both involved. It was late afternoon, described Wolfogel. I was called to the bedside of a leukemia patient who wasn't doing well. I was surprised to see a fourth-year medical student accompanying the intern. Didier introduced me to the patient and then asked some pertinent questions. He showed a lot of courage by taking charge in this manner while just a student. I told myself, here's a guy I need to keep my eye on. In 1984, Vaid Vogel asked Didier what field he wanted to specialize in later on in his career. Intensive care or hematology, perhaps, Didier replied hesitantly. How about infectious diseases? Does that tempt you? You don't take first-year fellows. There are only senior physicians on your team. For you, there might be an exception. Think about it. Didier, meanwhile, rotated through the required services. Pneumology, cardiology, nephrology, working with all the professors. Waldvogel continued to watch over him and encourage him. Didier did not harbor any preconceived notions about his career. Nothing in his family background suggested a predisposition towards medicine, other than his parents' wish to see their son succeed in his studies. Didier's father, Robert, was a master technician in Petit Lancy, a Geneva suburb. Didier's mother, Fernanda, left law school when her son was born in 1957 to care for the boy and manage the family's electrical shop. The Petits had to sell their tiny Fiat 500 Topolino to buy a stroller for their infant son. Didier's paternal grandparents were peasants who had settled in Petit Lancy at the beginning of the 20th century. His maternal grandfather was a sort of working class dandy employed by the local electric company. His wife, an energetic woman from Austria who had also lived for a while in Zurich, 
opened a fashionable open-air cafe to which Genevans flocked in the hundreds to enjoy the boule de bay sauce of ravigote, little sausages made of pork and smoked lard with mustard and mayonnaise. Didier's grandmother dreamt of living on the shores of Lake Geneva. Eventually, she bought a field overlooking the lake's left bank on the French side of the border in champs sur le mont Each night, she left her café well after midnight, sometimes as late as four in the morning. She would get on her Solex motorbike and, come rain, wind, or even snow, rode 20 kilometers to the house she had built on this site. Rather than falling exhausted onto bed, she watered her flowers, tended her garden, and never allowed herself more than five or six hours of sleep. The next afternoon, she would take the same route back, admiring the lake's dazzling waters. She lived to work, Didier says. My mother called her a vulture. She was a penny pincher, but nonetheless, she got along with everyone. Didier was born into this modest family with strong personalities, attached to the land around Petit Lancy. He was an extremely sensitive child, says Brigitte pité Guinot, his first wife, who married Didier in September 1983, just before he entered Weidvogel's service. My former mother-in-law told me that Didier cried a lot. Because other children were making fun of him, he once threw his glasses into a stream. His father was a plain, righteous man, a classic paterfamilia, endowed with natural authority, the big chief and the source of all wisdom. He liked sports and pushed Didier to surpass himself. Stop whining and second-guessing yourself and go for it. One can still detect a sensitive core in Didier, but he's built up a thick shell around it. Whatever he's doing, he has always sought to take the lead. He is firmly convinced that he has something to offer, so he has to take charge. It's not simply to satisfy his ego or his ambition. Instinctively, Francis Waldvogel felt this force. He counted on putting it to productive use by persuading Didier to specialize in infectious diseases. He could see a promising academic career ahead for the young doctor. A professor? Me? Never, replied Didier. You should at least think it over. Didier ended up following his mentor's advice. Now, you need to do some research, suggested Van Vogel. Research? Me? Never. Think it over. They spoke again six months later. Have you thought it over? Didier mumbled vaguely. You could study the behavior of white blood cells, suggested Van Vogel. Didier found himself in HUG's university laboratory. He knew nothing about biology and needed to learn everything, even how to use a pipette. He spent a lot of time with lab technicians. I owe them everything, he says. He published his first scientific paper in 1985. He was gifted, but one had the feeling that it did not interest him as much as clinical work, Vogel remarks. Really, the only problem I had with Didier was because I made him do several years of research on cellular biology. He had difficulty finishing the work. Trying to prepare him for an academic career did not generate much enthusiasm in him. It was too abstract. Didier had chosen medicine to help patients. He missed having contact with them. I got fed up with white blood cells, he said. Von Vogel saw a professional crisis coming and proposed that Didier investigate nosocomial infections. It involved field work in hospitals. We had no one doing this in Geneva. We needed someone who was outstanding. Didier seized this opportunity to escape from the laboratory. He studied infections linked to intravenous catheters. They caused 20 to 30 percent of hospital infections. For example, when the needle of a catheter is inserted into a vein, it can allow the bacteria that live on the surface of the skin to be introduced into the blood. Bacteremia, the presence of bacteria in the blood, results in mortality in one out of every four cases. 30% are attributable to central catheters, often inserted in the jugular vein, and about 1% to peripheral catheters, often placed in the arm. Didier readily recites these figures that were long ignored by medical professionals. If you don't know the speed you're actually driving on a road, you can't observe the speed limits. Monitoring infections is the first step towards preventing them. If the doctor didn't have these figures, he cannot devise the right treatment strategy. Didier paid no heed to professional taboos when he tackled the subject of nosocomial infections. In the somewhat patrician milieu of medicine, he stands out as a commoner, with the candor of an outsider. 
By virtue of his modest origins, he has not inherited any secret guilt or repressed bad conscience. His work does not risk compromising any close associates. He has no family reputation to uphold nor any vulnerabilities to protect. He started off on the path proposed by Waldvogel with the same passion he displays when he runs out onto a field for a soccer match or a skating rink for an ice hockey game. He gives the task his all without ever thinking about his career or a winning strategy. He's the sort of man who welcomes life's surprises. Chapter 1, Part 3 While carrying out numerous examinations of patients, Didier attempted to better understand the processes involved in infections. He worked day and night with the nursing staff. He learned their gestures, thought about the best method of treatment, as well as the techniques that would prevent bacteria from attaching to medical devices. He adopted as his own a question first asked by Pasteur. Instead of striving to kill microbes in wounds, wouldn't it be more reasonable not to put them there in the first place? Between fieldwork and the laboratory, he became an expert in the prevention of infections and the use of antibiotics. He published in scientific reviews, took part in congresses, met his peers, and visited establishments in France, Italy, Sweden, and Britain without ever renouncing contact with the patients themselves. As soon as a catheter needed to be withdrawn, the nurses called for Didier. He carried out the procedure, recovered the catheter, and placed it in a culture because it was inevitably contaminated by bacteria. He separated these out by means of ultrasound or with the help of a centrifuge, identified them, and counted them. Since then, the technique has become widespread. I simply improved on Dennis Mackey's method, he says modestly. The years went by. In 1988, Vogel told him, Now we need to think about the next step in your career. In our hospital, we have no infection control program. There really aren't any in Europe. It's something you should keep in mind. You have a gift for talking to people, and you're very attached to the patients. It seems to me it would be a good idea to create such a service at HUG, but first you should go to the United States. At that time, with respect to the prevention of infections, U.S. hospitals were 15 to 20 years ahead of Europe's. From the 1970s onward, it was increasingly common for lawyers to seek out lawsuits against hospitals in proven cases of nosocomial infections. Dear client, if we win, you get one half and I keep the rest. If we lose, it costs you nothing. Didier describes their shrewd tactics. Ironically, though, this legal trend indirectly contributed to encouraging research on the subject. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, commissioned a five-year study which revealed average rates of infection of 18% in American hospitals. According to the analysts, these rates could be reduced on two conditions. One, a doctor was appointed to take charge of prevention, and two, the technicians in his or her service monitor infections, evaluate infection rates, and report the results to the entire hospital staff in order to raise awareness. These monitoring procedures would be accompanied by improved hygiene measures, wearing masks and gloves, and washing hands with soap. Didier hesitated between two hospitals, that of Dennis Mackey and that of Richard Wenzel, the latter famous for having, among other things, described staphylococcus epidemics in healthcare centers. Weidvogel's verdict left no room for doubt. You'd be providing Mackey with more than he could provide you. It's not complicated at all. Go with Wenzel. You have a choice between Iowa City, Iowa City, and Iowa City. Chapter 1, Part 4 Iowa City nestles among cornfields to the southwest of the Great Lakes. In 1989, more than half of its 60,000 inhabitants were students. Richard Wenzel had just taken up his post at the University Hospital, one of the most respected in the United States. He was given the mission of making it the leader in the field of prevention. He started by multiplying the equivalent of road radars. Each time an infection was detected, his technicians analyzed its nature and origin. On a regular basis, they released statistics on infection rates. The initial figures were not at all reassuring. Nosocomal infections affected on average 18% of patients. Without serious consequences in the majority of cases, they entailed extra days of hospitalization, 
which multiplied costs by five. A bacteremia cost on average $40,000, so prevention was doubly advantageous. By saving lives, one could save money, a consideration that would please hospital directors, often better accountants than doctors. Wenzel's preventative work brought about a reduction in infection rates by a third, from 18% to 12%. But in U.S. hospitals, which did not have any prevention program, the rates increased to almost 21%. Medicine is changing, comments Didier. It's becoming more and more invasive. And only the patients most at risk remained in the hospital. That explains the increase in rates where nothing has been done to fight against infections. The difference between hospitals with and without prevention programs is almost 50%, he groaned. In the first group, you're twice as unlikely to become ill, twice as unlikely to die. While becoming specialized in epidemiology, a discipline not taught in Geneva, Didier made the rounds of the hospital departments with Wenzel's technicians. I did not know how it worked. We didn't have these kinds of experts. I learned everything from them. At the same time, he examined patients and taught courses on infectious diseases without neglecting to write more scientific papers. This intense activity left him little free time, but when the opportunity presented itself, Didier and Brigitte took their children to the shore of the lake formed by the Iowa River for water skiing, canoeing, swimming, and picnics. In this region far from the great urban centers, life passed by quietly. He never attached much importance to relaxation, Brigitte said. For him, we weren't there to enjoy ourselves or to rest, but to serve. He's always been hyperactive. Back at the hospital, one thing struck Didier very quickly. Wenzel's technicians had barely any medical qualifications. They were allowed to look at patients' files, but they didn't interact with the doctors. They limited themselves to recording infections and calculating the rates. Didier found this passiveness incomprehensible. He'd already practiced internal medicine in Geneva. He'd worked with cardiologists, pneumologists, and nephrologists. In Canada, during his fourth year of study, he had the chance to assist surgeons. When seeing patients, he made it a habit to perform a hands-on examination. In his eyes, limiting one's self to stoically measuring excessive infection rates was not the right method. Unlike climatologists, who helplessly register the warming of the biosphere, Didier wanted to act. Upon his return to Switzerland, he would not hire technicians with minimal medical training, but instead highly qualified nurses. They would observe, then intervene, and they would be given the means to do so. In 1991, during a trip to Geneva, he outlined his action plan to HUG's head nurse, Nicole Fischter, who was delighted by it. I'd visited him in the United States. I, too, was convinced he would need clinical nurse specialists. In collaboration with Nicole, Didier then took the most important decision of his life. Having been a doctor up until this point, he would become a sociologist. He would, henceforth, take an interest in the behavior of healthcare workers, and not just catheters. Chapter 1, Part 5 in the spring of 1992, Nicole Fischter sent four clinical nurse specialists to Iowa City to train with Wenzel's teams. Upon their return to Geneva, they found themselves left to their own devices. While waiting for Didier to join us, recalls Josiane Stager Boissard, we only had one assignment, writing a report. It was at that point that the MRSA epidemic broke out. We knew methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus existed but it was another thing entirely to discover it in our own hospital. We tried putting in place a training and prevention program, isolating patients, hand hygiene, attacking the staphylococci with a cocktail of antibiotics. We went round all the services. Everyone listened to us, as there was a bit of panic at the time. When Didier returned to Switzerland for good in October 1992, no one doubted any longer the need to set up a new infection control and prevention service. The battle against MRSA meant that everyone knew us, explained Yosian. Along with her and her three nursing colleagues, Pascal Hero, Nicole Henry, and Anna Alexiou, Didier decided to measure the hospital's infection rates. Some conservative service chiefs who were jealous of their prerogatives did not look kindly on this study. 
They dislike the idea of an audit. Why does he have four nurse specialists? They'd be more useful working in emergency. At the same time, HUG's administrative direction became involved. It was interested in nosocomial infections and wanted to place Didier under its wing. Valfogel, on the other hand, sought to keep him in the academic domain. There were tensions, he observes, some exchanges back and forth that weren't always handled well. For Didier, there was never a question of giving up. He and his team trained, tested its methods, and perfected them. I joined them at that point, recounts Valéry Sauvin. I replaced Josiane, who was about to have a baby. The others looked at me a little dismissively at first. I was quite young. We spent a week going through all the services, seeing all the patients, recording all the infections. We were fanatical about it. We completed our normal working hours and then worked on the study from 8 p.m. until 1 a.m. Didier bought us chocolate. It was so funny. This young doctor made me want to get fully involved. We had the feeling that things were moving in the right direction, so we followed him. Very quickly, the figures emerged. 18% of infections on average with peaks of more than 30% in intensive care. Didier refused to believe it at first. We are in Switzerland, not Zimbabwe, after all. Three months later, once the data had been digested, they repeated the study. 17%. Another three months went by, and they once again obtained 18%. The nurses worked ceaselessly. Didier followed up on their work, checking their results. And they followed up on him, checking his findings. They compared data. The rates remained worrying. And elsewhere, Didier wondered anxiously, aware that his hospital was one of the best in the country. The infections spared no service. They circulated throughout the hospital and no barrier could stop them. Didier searched for a prime cause. One day in 1994, a nurse spoke to him about a patient infected by a resistant germ. The following day, the same germ was found in a neighboring room. Something transferred it. Little by little, the truth became obvious. We have infections in our establishment, reasoned Didier. We know they're conveyed by the ventilation system, the instruments, in the patients themselves, but above all by the hands of healthcare workers. We must not have been careful enough in that respect. And so the story of Ignaz Semmelweis began to haunt him.